Well, let me uh, add uh, my uh, welcome. And uh, it's been a pleasure working on these six uh, State of the West events uh, uh, with Mark and Bruce and particularly David Kennedy. Um, I'm going to try to uh, establish a precedent here, which is uh, short introductions. Uh, the bios are in your program, so I don't think uh, lengthy introductions uh, are needed. Uh, but I do have the honor uh, of introducing uh, Jatan uh, De Selva, uh, Alberta's, Alberta's senior uh, representative uh, to the United States. And her assignment in Washington, D.C. is to promote Alberta's economic and policy interests in the areas such as uh, energy, the environment, and agriculture. She previously served as the Deputy Minister of Alberta's International and Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Affairs. Um, and before joining uh, the Alberta government, uh, she worked in the Canadian uh, Foreign Service uh, for 12 years. It's hard for me to think of Foreign Service. In, in, in her specialty was Canada-US relations. Uh, and um, so not, uh, I, I never think of that as completely foreign, but uh, um, I'm sure from a Canadian perspective, relationships with the US is foreign relations. Um, given uh, the circumstances of political change and so forth, I can't think of a more appropriate uh, opening keynote speaker than Jatan uh, De Silva, uh, given the uh, uh, discussions of restructuring NAFTA or uh, with the prospect of uh, new energy policies, uh, including uh, new pipelines and so forth. Uh, I, think, uh, um, I think Bruce inferred that maybe we're just lucky uh, in getting the right topics here, but it seems like we have a great set of topics. The uh, program now is uh, to last, this particular opening program, until 1.30. And uh, what we'll do is, after her talk, uh, I'll sit here and uh, ask a couple questions, and then turn it over to you, and you'll have a chance uh, to ask questions. Uh, so as I think I told Ellen, um, when we start is variable, but when we end is fixed. We're going to end at 1.30. OK. Jatan. <laughs> lose my shoe on the way up. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. The U.S. may not seem exotic, but I can now speak American. I can say y'all and trash and soda, so I am learning. Um, and I should say, I grew up in Alberta, but I finished my last year of high school in the town of Kelowna, British Columbia, which at the time was about 100,000 people, and there were about 150 kids in my graduating class, and it never occurred to me to apply to U.S. college or university, and it certainly never applied to me to apply to somewhere like Stanford, but one of my classmates did, and she got in. And so there was a story in the local paper, and it was a really big deal. And my dad said to me at the time, oh, don't worry, honey. If you had applied, you would have got in. So when I was asked to speak here in place of Prima Notley, I called my mom, as my dad has since passed away, and I said, guess what, mom? I got into Stanford, and I didn't even have to apply. <laughs> so <clears throat> she's pretty excited. And it is, it is really an honor to be here on behalf of the government of Alberta and our leader, Prima Rachel Notley. She very much wanted to be here today, but there was a pretty big announcement made by our federal government earlier this week that I'll talk about in a little bit, but she asked me to please send her best regards. And thank you to the Bill Lane Center and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research for bringing us all together. Um, as John mentioned, I have the honor and privilege of serving as Alberta's senior representative to the United States. And what that means is I get to travel across your great country, talking about one of my favorite things, which is my home province of Alberta, which I might be a little bit biased, but I think is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Alberta's priorities here in the U.S. and in the West in particular. I know that some of you will have been to Alberta. I had a great conversation at my lunch table about that. Um, but given that some of you may be less familiar with my province, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of an introduction. So Alberta is immediately north of Montana on the western edge of the Canadian um, prairies and the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. By Canadian standards, we're a pretty big province, just a little smaller geographically than the state of Texas with about 4 million people, including two cities, Calgary and Edmonton, for the hockey fans out there that have a population of more than a million each. 
We are 11% of Canada's population, but about 16% of Canada's GDP. And our history has a familiar ring to it. Like the American West, Alberta was originally home of Indigenous peoples. Europeans, first traders, and farmers and ranchers began putting down roots in the 18th century. To this day, Alberta remains one of the giants of Canada's agricultural sector. In fact, we lead our country in beef production. We are also major exporters of wheat and canola seed, and we are the world's fifth largest producer of honey. And Albertans continue to prize the rugged frontier mentality associated with the West, even as most people today keep their cowboy boots in the closet, except for special occasions. We are also famous for the geological feature that has fueled our economy for decades, the oil sands. This mixture of oil, water, clay, and sand found in northern Alberta comprises the third largest proven oil reserves on Earth. And while we are often stereotyped because of our resources, Alberta is an incredibly diverse place, and not just economically. The breadth of opinion the province contains is much broader than many outsiders expect. These days, that is truer than ever. In the spring of 2015, after 44 years of consecutive conservative rule, Albertans elected our first ever left of center government, the New Democratic Party, led by Premier Rachel Notley. And now my oil-rich, cattle-raising Western heartland, led by an ambitious and unabashedly progressive left-wing government, is doing things differently. And that's what I want to talk about today. No one in Alberta would deny that we needed a different approach. The ongoing oil price trough has been especially painful for our province. And even before the prices slumped, Alberta had to sell our oil at roughly a 25% discount because we lacked the means to reach buyers overseas. A natural disaster last spring further added to this toll. Fort McMurray, the biggest city in the oil sands region, suffered tremendous damage in a wildfire. And I'd like to thank all of you here in the U.S. West for your support during that difficult time, including for the firefighters sent by Montana and Idaho. It is really wonderful to know that in times of crisis, we can count on our neighbors for support. So with energy investment down, sectors such as housing, retail, construction, and manufacturing also weakened, and public revenues dropped by almost 15%. Fortunately, the worst of the downturn looks to be behind us. Alberta's economy is expected to expand next year by more than 2%, driven by reconstruction in Fort McMurray and a rebound in oil production. Some economists are predicting that in the next couple of years, we will once again lead Canada in economic growth. However, the lessons of this latest slowdown have not been lost on the government. The tendency in Alberta in the past was to cut drastically during a bust and then spend money racing to catch up in a boom. Tracking spending to the price of oil feels a little bit like a roller coaster ride, and Alberta no longer does it. Rather than making a bad situation worse, the current government is keeping public services stable in the short term when more people are out of work and need help, while controlling costs over the longer term to deal with the deficit. The Alberta government has the means to act as a shock absorber. Our net debt to GDP ratio is the lowest in Canada. But spending does need to come down. Premier Notley's fiscal plan reduces growth in the government's operating budget to an average of 2% over the next three years, the lowest rate in a decade. At the same time, the province isn't waiting for growth to come back. Only the private sector can drive recovery. Alberta is already the best place in Canada to work, do business, and invest. We have the highest nominal GDP per capita of any province and a highly educated and skilled workforce. And even with the fall in oil and gas spending, Alberta attracts the highest level of private investment in Canada. We also have the country's lowest taxes, including no provincial sales tax. People and businesses in Alberta pay roughly 7.5 billion less in tax than they would in other provinces. And government is enhancing these benefits with a range of policy supports. Economic diversification is a must. That's been the clearest takeaway from the latest oil price crash, and Premier Notley is encouraging it as widely as possible. Alberta's 2016 budget introduced two new tax credits, one for investors in small and medium-sized businesses, and the other for capital investment. Effective January 1, 2017, the small business tax rate will be cut by one-third. Access to capital for entrepreneurs is improving as well. Alberta has a publicly owned financial institution called the Alberta Treasury Branch. The government has raised its lending capacity by $1.5 billion. And the province has an organization devoted to managing its fiscal assets, the Alberta Investment Management Corporation, also known as AIMCO. Premier Notley has instructed AIMCO to invest $540 million in ventures judged to have high growth potential. 
Her government is also adding value to Alberta's energy resources through the Petrochemicals Diversification Program, offering up to $500 million in royalty credits to investors building new facilities that manufacture petrochemical-based products in the province. Global investors representing more than $20 billion in investment have applied to this program. But leaving diversification aside, there is still a basic truth that the government of Alberta recognizes and embraces. It is this. Energy exports will continue to fuel provincial prosperity for decades to come. With the third largest oil reserves on the planet, it couldn't be any other way. Our oil matters to many more people than just Albertans. Alberta, Alberta, not all of Canada, but Alberta on itself, is the largest foreign supplier of oil to the United States, accounting for approximately 30% of imports. We know that climate change is real and is caused by human activity. We also know that the transition to a low carbon economy will not happen overnight and that oil and gas will continue to play an important role in the world's energy mix for years to come. The switch away from fossil fuels will be gradual. And over that period, other countries will continue to rely on oil for soily, sorely needed development. Alberta's trading partners are counting on it as well. Every year, oil sands producers spend millions of dollars in research and development to reduce the environmental impact of extraction. They also spend billions of dollars on products and services, creating jobs far beyond Alberta's borders, including here in the United States. If this growth is to continue, Alberta needs new pipelines. Pipelines are the safest and most cost-effective means of transporting oil. Pipelines have long been a priority for Alberta, and to secure them, Premier Notley has taken a different approach. Alberta acknowledges that energy production has environmental consequences, and we are addressing these directly out of a sense of responsibility and because mitigating that impact enables Alberta to stand out in a crowded marketplace. Growing awareness of the threat of climate change means that where oil comes from and how it is produced matters more than ever. Taking action on climate change is the right thing to do for people today and for our children tomorrow. In November 2015, Alberta announced the Climate Leadership Plan. The plan is based on four elements. First, an economy-wide price on carbon, starting at $20 per tonne in January 2017 and rising to $30 per tonne the year after. Second, a shift away from coal-fired electricity to renewable energy and natural gas by 2030. Third, an emissions cap of 100 megatons for the oil sands. And fourth, a 45% decrease in methane emissions from oil and gas by 2025, starting with a baseline from 2014. The Climate Leadership Plan is one of the most significant steps any energy producer has taken on the environment. Alberta is showing how the economy and environmental protection go hand in hand, and the process of bringing the plan to life by passing the required legislation is well underway. The Climate Leadership Plan was not created unilaterally. The transition to a lower carbon lifestyle includes everyone. The conversation about the plan involved the energy industry, NGOs, municipalities, and ordinary Albertans. And as the plan moves forward, government is making a special effort to reach out to one group in particular, our Indigenous peoples. Premier Notley has put reconciliation and a renewed relationship with them at the core of her agenda. She is working with Indigenous leaders, communities, and organizations to implement the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And her government is enhancing programs from justice and education to culture and resource development to ensure that Alberta's Indigenous communities are healthy, prosperous, and strong. There has been a lot of interest in the opportunities available as the Climate Leadership Plan steers the province onto a more sustainable course. As equal partners, government and Indigenous groups are setting up programs to enable the latter to participate in the green economy while contributing to emissions reductions. The Climate Leadership Plan is also meant to improve Alberta's relationship with the rest of Canada. There is an ongoing debate about Canada's energy future, and Alberta is changing the tone of the conversation by responding to doubts over our environmental record, and I'm delighted to say that it's working. As I mentioned earlier this week, Canada's federal government approved the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline to Canada's Pacific Coast. A pipeline to tidewater on Canadian soil is essential if Alberta's energy producers are to reach international markets. Our long sought after goal is now closer than ever. In his announcement, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau specifically mentioned that federal approval could not have happened without Alberta's climate leadership plan. We're obviously excited by this progress and what it promises for the future of our energy sector. But I want to make clear that Alberta is not exclusively looking for overseas market access. Given the state of our economy and our energy industry, 
and our very long-standing friendship with the United States, it's crucial that we work together on a number of paths. Certainly, the Canadian and U.S. energy markets are closely integrated. Those connections are vital for jobs and growth in both our countries. And I'm pleased to say that there's good news on this front as well. The Trudeau government approved a second pipeline this week, the Canadian portion of the Line 3 replacement, which carries oil from Alberta to Wisconsin. If completed, the new high-tech line will be safer. It will more than double the existing pipeline's current capacity, transporting 760,000 barrels per day and increasing North American energy security. The U.S. is Alberta's largest trading partner, and we're always interested in building on this important relationship. And there is a little, um, I guess, more well-known proposal which could also help accomplish this, the Keystone XL pipeline. Alberta will be watching developments on this file closely in the months ahead as the incoming U.S. government decides the project's phase. Regardless of what happens on Keystone, Alberta's government will keep looking for ways to strengthen our links with the United States. We consider the U.S. a great friend and neighbor, and we're a proud member of the family of Western states and provinces. We're active in organizations like the Council of States Governments West and the Western Governors Association. As a free trading province, Alberta is further motivated by the increased trade flows and jobs that come with them. Economic exchanges between Alberta and the American West amount to tens of billions of dollars annually, and we want these to continue. Just as the U.S. is Alberta's number one export market, Canada is the number one export market for 35 U.S. states, including several in the West, such as Montana, Colorado, Idaho, North Dakota, and South Dakota. When you have such a diverse trading relationship, disputes inevitably arise. There are those files where we are currently actively engaged, like softwood lumber, and others we are watching, such as agriculture and energy, that are critical to states and provinces on both sides of the border. As we work through these issues, we must never forget that the tens of billions of dollars in trade and the hundreds of thousands of visitors moving across the border in each direction represent a relationship of incredible breadth and depth. For instance, Alberta is one of Hollywood's favorite backdrops. Dozens of film and TV productions choose our province when they need dramatic landscapes. These projects add hundreds of millions of dollars to economies on both sides of the border. Our province also has a collaboration agreement with Nevada to encourage joint economic development. This has allowed an Alberta-based enterprise, Verimap, to partner with a U.S. company, Drone America, on the creation of remote sensing technology to monitor illegal fishing and fire hazards in Asia. The ties between us <coughs> excuse me, are too strong to be overshadowed by any one issue. We can and must work together as states and provinces and as a region to protect and expand our vital economic linkages. Of course, as states and provinces that have grown up together, our relationship extends far beyond the economic. As I mentioned, Alberta is extremely grateful for the support we received during the Fort Murray fires. This is another example of the big things we do for one another in times of need. But there are less heralded examples of cooperation that go on all the time. Recently, we sent specially trained dogs to Montana to sniff out invasive mussels spreading in that state's waterways and Alberta's herd of wood buffalo has helped to restore that species across the United States. Each year, Alberta legislators meet with state legislators during the Council of State Government meetings to compare notes and share solutions to common challenges. It is amazing how little nationality and partisanship matter in conversations about how to better deliver social services, what's working in primary education, and how we can, encou how we can counter drought. These discussions don't normally resort in a memorandum of understanding or high-level declarations, but they do represent the secret wiring that carries policy ideas across our region and allow us to build on success and tackle shared challenges together. Everyone thrives through these arrangements. This is the real success story, success story of the North American West. We have been brought together by simple geographic proximity, and we work together because we trust each other, knowing that we share the same values and goals. Westerners need each other to succeed, and that will never change. Alberta is and will remain a proud voice for Western prosperity and success. United by history, dreams, and culture, I have no doubt that our friends throughout the region will be right there alongside us. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. So I hope you're uh, preparing questions, because I don't... You're better at this than I am, but I'll, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, one thing you didn't, you mentioned a lot, I think it was great. Uh, I don't think you mentioned NAFTA. And yet NAFTA's been in the news. And talk about 
improving it or restructuring it or whatever, uh, what do you think is uh, going to happen? Is it, should, should something change with NAFTA? Or, but just give us your perspective on how NAFTA's work for Alberta and whether it needs changing. Sure. Well, the U.S. is Alberta's number one export market. 87% of what we export comes here. So obviously, ongoing market access is crucially important to us. Mexico is about our fifth largest trading partner. So obviously, that's important as well. I think it remains to be seen. Many, in many past presidential elections, um, candidates have argued against NAFTA. So I think it remains to see what path forward the incoming administration takes. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that trade deals have winners and losers. And we as governments have not always done a great job about addressing those that um, experience the downside of a trade agreement. But I can say um, that our government in Alberta um, is working to, has been very engaged in modernizing some of Canada's domestic trade agreements. We have something called the Agreement on Internal Trade, uh, which regulates trade between uh, provinces. And that's somewhere our government, for example, is, uh, had campaigned on a $15 an hour minimum wage. So when they were elected, the wage was $10 an hour, and over the course of three years, they're increasing it to 15. So when we look to renegotiate trade agreements, those are some of the priorities that Alberta has. A fair living wage, uh, protection for the environment, good labor standards, those types of things. And we would expect to be fully engaged in a conversation the federal government has with the U.S. and Mexico. So I may display my naivete here, but um, as the government shifted from the conservatives to the NDP, uh, uh, a left of center party, then I hear we're proud that we have low taxes, we're going to cut business taxes, we're going to grow the government slowly, the budget. It didn't sound as left of center as, as I know it. Um, uh, the climate leadership, that might be consi more consistent with my image, mm -hmm. but um, what policy changes accompanied the shift from the Conservatives to the NDP? Big policy changes. Would it be climate or would it be other things that, that change? Because the tax policy didn't seem to change particularly. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that in Canada, similar to the US, I mean a Republican in Texas is probably different than a Republican in California. Uh, an NDP government in Alberta is going to be different than one uh, somewhere like Quebec. So there were five main pillars to Premier Notley's campaign. A big one was climate change, so taking action. Past governments had talked about it, and we did have um, a price on, garbage, on carbon for what were the specified large emitters, so industrial sources already had either to reduce their emissions or pay into a technology fund, but that was a big one. Uh, resetting Alberta's relationship with Indigenous peoples. Uh, Edmonton, Alberta has the largest urban Aboriginal population in all of Canada and uh, they're a very large percentage of our population, and so making sure that we're having a respectful relationship there. I mentioned uh, around minimum wage. That was also something the government campaigned on. Um, there were some made changes made to the tax structure. Previously in Alberta, we had a flat tax, so regardless of your income level, everyone paid the same amount of income tax, and the Notley government changed that to a progressive uh, rate, so the more you earn, the more you pay. Uh, but those are really the big elements, and also ensuring that we would maintain social services. As I said, in my prepared remarks in the past, every time the price of oil went bust, the government would cut uh, a number of services to a point where we had one government that actually stopped funding kindergarten. Um, but the current government is not taking that approach. And the other thing they're doing is investing in infrastructure. Um, we had quite a big boom in Alberta to the point where we don't have adequate public infrastructure, roads, schools, and high school um, and hospitals to support our population. So we're taking the opportunity of some of our skilled trades, people being out of work and the low price of boring to fund those types of things so that as the economy comes back, we actually have the right infrastructure in, in place to support our population. Well, you have to, well, you being Alberta, have to make some other fiscal adjustments if oil <coughs> were to stay, say, at $50 a barrel. Mm -hmm. Because obviously in the boom times, it was $100 a barrel. And, uh, and I know you enjoy this no sales tax or that or whatever, and uh, is that sustainable or will you have to look for more tax resources if oil doesn't come back? Well, I think the government's very focused on economic diversification, so it's growing those other sectors of the economy that can contribute to the provincial coffers. I would say that a provincial sales tax in Alberta is sort of one of those political no-go zones. It's not something that has been entertained. Um, you know, I think you have to be realistic as, as your revenues plateau, then you have to look at different options, but it's not something that's on the table at the moment. 
And so instead what they're looking to do is make these investments like provide royalty cuts for uh, new economic diversification plans to hopefully grow the economy that way in the longer run. Okay, I think, uh, you know, I'm out of good questions. I may have been out of them before we started. But, uh, uh, why don't uh, you help me out? So who do, who do we have here? Just shout out for a mic if you would. Okay. There we go. You've mentioned several times that uh, relationships with Native American tribes is, uh, or Native so Canadian tribes, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, are a, a critical focus of the current administration and that there's been some improvement. As you know, this is a, an issue in the United States right now uh, and both the sacred lands issues and also some of them want to develop their natural resources, others don't. Uh, so talk a little bit about what it takes to have good relationships with native tribes. Well, I would just start by explaining for those who aren't familiar, um, Aboriginal peoples in Canada have rights enshrined in our constitution. So the federal government and provincial governments have what's called a duty to consult with Aboriginal peoples <clears throat> on a variety of issues, but certainly when you're looking at doing resource development or building a road or something that goes uh, through their territory. So there is a legal responsibility on governments to consult with Aboriginal peoples. And when that duty is not uh, fulfilled, um, Aboriginal um, organizations have taken their concerns to the court. And we just had an instant, for example, the Prime Minister approved two pipelines, but declined to approve a third, the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project, where an Aboriginal group had taken their concerns to the Supreme Court of Canada and the Supreme Court of Rule that they were not adequately consulted, that the federal government did not fulfill its duty to consult. So we start from a different place, I think, than you do in the United States because they do have these rights enshrined in the Constitution. What we're really trying to do is to develop more of a government-to-government -government relationship. Our provincial government first and then the federal government as well have said that we would adopt the principles of the UN rights, um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples which lies out, uh, outlines a number of things. But it is really key in Canada, and certainly in the Western provinces where there's a higher Aboriginal population, that if you want to grow your economy, if you want to uplift all people, we unfortunately in Canada and in Alberta, if you look at socioeconomic data, it is often our Aboriginal communities uh, that suffer the most. And that should not, it should not be that because you were born Aboriginal, you have a much less likely chance of finishing high school or going to university you should not be at a greater risk of domestic violence or all these other things that are realities for Aboriginal Canadians. So our provincial government and the federal government are both very engaged on this issue. We also have uh, an unfortunate history in Canada with our Aboriginal peoples. Our Aboriginal peoples did not get the right to vote until I think it was the 1960s. I'm looking at Eve to remind me, but it was quite late. And there are other issues as well in terms of we had a residential school system whereby children were removed from the reservation and sent to schools run by non-Aboriginal people in the hopes of, hopes of quote unquote, integrating them into society. So we're dealing with that legacy now. We've gone through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where we have admitted that what we did was wrong and now we're looking to move forward from that. So I think the first step in that conversation is wanting, genuinely wanting to rebuild the relationship. It has been, I can say in Alberta, very well received. We have certain structures in place as well. So we have in Alberta, the Aboriginal Consultation Office whereby a proponent of a project, whatever that project is, works for this government office to make sure that they are consulting everyone who should be consulted. And then we also do things like develop equity partnerships. So if you are building something in a remote region of the province, we make sure that as a result of your construction project, an Aboriginal community has roads, year-round roads, that they have uh, you know, good internet access and a bunch of other things that might be harder for them to achieve if there weren't for a project coming by. And they might also also get equity long term into the project, which would secure better education and training for specific jobs that that um, project would create. Tom. Here comes the mic, Tom, right behind you. <clears throat> I'd like to get you to expand a bit on the carbon tax you mentioned. Um, I'm familiar with what's been done in British Columbia and was really designed as a revenue neutral carbon tax by uh, essentially reducing ta other taxes mm -hmm. to offset it. Can you talk a little bit about 
characteristics of the uh, of the carbon tax that you either said it is being or has recently been instituted in Alberta from a revenue standpoint and what's happening to those revenues? Mm -hmm. So our price takes effect January 1st, 2017. Starts at $20, increases to $30, and it is economy-wide. Uh, so once in place, it'll have the broadest coverage of any jurisdiction within Canada. So very few things are exempted from it, or else ends producers are included in that and everything else. So the funds will be used for a few things. Uh, one, low and middle income Albertans will receive a rebate check, as we do not want this to penalize or make vulnerable people more vulnerable. So um, our view is that a price on carbon will change behaviors. So hopefully seeing an increased price on things, people will decrease their use of certain products. And then, uh, like I say, about 60% of Albertans who are low and middle income will get a rebate check from the government. Some of the money raised will go to fund technologies to further reduce the greenhouse gas impact of our energy sector. So funding research projects are helping to commercialize um, some projects that work on a smaller scale and we want to try them on a larger scale. We're also setting up an energy efficiency agency. Alberta was the only jurisdiction in Canada that didn't have an energy efficiency agency, so that is being stood up. And that organization will provide grants and other things to help ordinary Albertans make sure that their home is as efficient as possible and all these types of things. So we've taken a slightly different approach from British Columbia that is not meant to be revenue neutral, but our approach was that all of the revenues generated from the carbon tax or carbon price would remain in the province. Do we have one over here? Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, did you bring visa applications? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, second question, given your experience in the foreign relations between Canada and the United States, even though Trudeau and Trump start with a T, how would you navigate the relationship in a very quickly changing diplomatic scene in Washington where many of the people, at least preliminarily, seem to lack experience in international diplomacy? What do you think Canada should be doing in terms of furthering a constructive relationship post-election? Well, I think it's always important to treat the relationship with respect. And as I said in my remarks, I mean, this is an incredibly broad and deep relationship with so many ties that it goes beyond any one issue or any one leader. Uh, I never think it's well received if someone tells someone else what to do and how to do it. So we'll be respectful of that relationship. Obviously, we respect the choice made by the American people and look forward to working with the incoming administration. Um, for us, trade will be a big priority, not only for the province, but for the country. As I mentioned, Alberta, 87% of our exports come here, but this is true for all provinces across Canada, with the exception of British Columbia, that this is uh, the number one trading market. So we want to make sure that we are having um, informed conversations and looking for um, some new allies to carry our message. You know, in the United States, in my experience, um, if one votes here or one can support a political campaign, one voice is heard louder than a foreign government. So talking to a lot of companies that operate on both sides of the border about what it is that they hope their new administration will do and where there's commonality working to carry that message together. And I think we have to give the new administration a chance, just like in Alberta when we elected the first change of government. We in Alberta do not change parties often. We had the Conservatives for 44 years. Before that, we had the Social Credit for 36. I mean, we, stick, we pick a party and we stick with it. So when I was the Deputy Minister, which is like being an undersecretary or the bureaucratic head of a provincial agency, and I was at a meeting with my deputy minister colleagues, and we all looked at each other and said, okay, who has an employee that worked on the last party transition? And we had two in the whole public service who were 50-year employees. So, you know, change is big and change is hard, but you have to give people a chance. And I think that's what you have to do is really um, demonstrate a willingness, as our prime minister has done, saying that if you would like to talk about NAFTA, we're prepared to have that conversation. And then we'll see where it goes from there. But Alberta and Canada have also acknowledged that we are not deviating from our plans on climate, that we will continue to move forward with the provincial price and the federal price and those measures taken. Um, so I think that's important as well, that we, we as governments are still going to advocate for our best interests, and we believe it's in our best interest to move forward with programs like that. Can you clarify uh, just how you work with the Canadian ambassador to the U.S., and how do you coordinate the, the sort of federal level policy with the provincial level policy in your own job? Well, different from like the Hall of States in Washington where the state's offices are separate, my office is in the embassy and I meet with the ambassador very regularly. 
Uh, we work closely together on a number of files, and so where the province and the federal government's um, positions align, we work together, we'll meet with senators together, governors together. Uh, he's traveled with me back to Alberta a couple of times and given speeches, jointly briefed our cabinet, those types of things. Uh, so we work very closely together. Of course, there are instances where we disagree, uh, but we try as little as possible to air our dirty laundry in public. Um, you know, so we really do try to work together. And we have, we're fortunate now that the federal government in Canada has a very collaborative approach, similar to the U.S. There's matters of jurisdiction. Energy is owned by the provinces. It's not owned by the federal government. So the federal government can take certain actions, but at the end of the day, to fully implement the federal climate action plan, they actually need the full engagement of the provinces. So we really do try to work together and find common ground. Mark here. Uh, so later today, I'll be um, moderating a session on healthcare mm -hmm. in, here in the U.S., uh, in the West. And I'm curious, uh, in Canada, I've heard a lot about there being some big issues in, in healthcare there. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the sort of breakdown of responsibility is between the federal government and Alberta's government. Here in the U.S., mm -hmm. Medicare, the health insurance for the elderly, is uh, covered by the federal government, mm -hmm. whereas Medicaid, which it was mentioned earlier, uh, provides coverage to lower income people, is Based more the responsibility of states. And so I'm curious, what it, are there similar sorts of divisions between federal and provincial responsibilities, and what do you see as the, the big issues that are coming down the pike? I'm guessing costs are an issue, and aging population, and more expensive treatments, and how is Canada, uh, how is Alberta uh, going to uh, need to balance that? Or is that not front and center for Alberta as a province? It absolutely is. If you look at, so in Canada, we have publicly funded health care. Everyone gets health care. You never get a bill. You go to the hospital. I mean, you get a bill. You pay your taxes. But you don't. when you go to the hospital, you don't pay. You would pay for your prescription medication uh, if you don't have additional coverage through your employer or private insurance. But other than that, you wouldn't pay for a surgery or a doctor's visit or anything. It's just it's publicly funded. The federal government has the Canada Health Act, which, lies, which outlines the responsibilities. For example, um, there are very minimal services in Canada for which you can pay. Like, you can pay for an MRI or a 3D ultrasound when you're pregnant. But you can't, uh, doctors can't charge for the majority of things, and that's sort of what's outlined in the Canada Health Care Act. And we have a system in Canada whereby the federal government collects all tax revenue and then redistributes it across the province, and we have a system of transfer payments. So uh, we guarantee a minimum level of social services across the country. So if you were living in a jurisdiction that is more economically depressed, a more economically advantaged part of the country would, in fact, transfer some of its tax revenue to you to ensure that you have quality health care in your jurisdiction. That said, it's up to provinces to administer um, health care, and it comes out of provincial budgets. The federal government, in the past, um, did, they do provide a transfer payment to the province, which funds a number of social programs, but they also um, have it's decreased. It well, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a chunk of money. Then the province gets to decide whether they pay for post-secondary, because we also have publicly funded post-secondary education in Canada, so some of that money goes to fund that, some goes for health care goes for a variety of things. So um, the, the premiers and the prime minister will be meeting shortly in the coming weeks. They have what's called a first minister's meeting. And they sit around the table and talk about a number of issues. They'll be talking about climate change. So they'll certainly, I'm sure, be talking about the U.S. election and its impacts. But they're also talking about health care and a push by the provinces for the federal government to increase its portion of the funding because it has decreased dramatically over the past 25 years. So it used to be that they funded 50%. Now it's down below 20 and the provinces would like to get that back up at least to 25%. For the province of Alberta, the health care budget re represents close to 50% of provincial spending. And this is not uncommon across the country. It's usually right around 40, between 40 and 50%. So it is a major preoccupation of all jurisdictions across the country. And it's not only the impact of aging populations. In Alberta, we've done a study, and our most expensive demographic is exactly men between the ages of 18 and 30 because um, they may make, make some life choices that aren't as wise, or they're working in higher risk professions, or that is our highest cost demographic in Alberta is actually young men. So how do you work together? And then other challenges we've had in Alberta is because the oil sector pays very good salaries, that has forced the public sector to pay higher salaries to doctors and nurses, otherwise they might go work for, you know, work in a fly-in camp in the oil sands. So how do you, as we renegotiate, because these are negotiations between the province and a public sector union or professional association, how do you bring those costs down? So similar to the way you might, in a, in a state, negotiate with a number of insurers together on a common rate for a sp particular service, as some of the conversations that we have with our doctors and nurses about, you know, 
how can we bend this cost curve? And we're making investments in things like health IT and other things. Uh, you know, you talk about telehealth or connecting rural communities with doctors through the equivalent of FaceTime or Skype, those types of things. So people are everywhere are looking for innovative solutions to bend that cost curve. Okay, I'm looking out through this, these lights. Give me, help me if you want to ask a question. You got one? Okay. Wait for the mic. Sorry. I know that uh, British Columbia has been very open to immigration from Vietnam and other mm -hmm. places. I wondered about the characteristics in Alberta. Has, has that population been changing? Maybe you could talk about immigration and emigration mm -hmm. from Alberta. How, how's, how, how's that working? So um, I grew up in Alberta. When I grew up in Alberta, you were either multi-generation Canadian or Ukrainian. That was kind of it. We did have a bit of a Vietnamese population. Uh, but I had left the province and moved back 25 years later, and it is incredibly diverse. Not as diverse as Vancouver or Toronto, but we now have one in five Albertans who was born outside of Canada. So it's much more um, internationally diverse, a real diversity of um, religions and languages as well. For example, in Edmonton, the city where I was living, in Canada we have publicly funded French education. Um, but we also had in Edmonton a Mandarin school, a Spanish school, a Ukrainian school. Uh, so a real variety and very diverse. We remain very open and welcoming of immigration. I think that's a real point of pride for Canadians. Uh, you know, we stepped forward and took in a large number of Syrian refugees in Alberta. We sort of um, tried to take our percentage. So we're 11% of the population. We said we take 11% of the Syrian refugees, which we have done and had a number of private organizations come forward looking to sponsor refugees and immigrants. We also in Alberta are the largest um, province for in-migration within Canada. And that's because for a long period of time, Alberta was really the economic engine of Canada. When the oil sector was booming, uh, there was a real shortage in a number of skilled trades and other professions. So people from other parts of Canada would move to Alberta for good paying jobs. A large uh, number of people from Atlantic Canada, for instance. We developed direct flights to all parts of Canada for people, because uh, often in the oil sands, people would work three weeks on, one week off. So there would be direct flights from parts of Newfoundland um, they used to joke that you get the second freshest seafood in all of Canada was in Fort McMurray because these planes would come daily from the coast. So, And even with the crash in the price of oil, we have not seen the out-migration that one would expect. Um, Alberta really is a beautiful province. I don't know how many of you have been there, but uh, it is a sort of a quality of life question for a lot of people with the Rocky Mountains and ample opportunities for hiking, fishing, hunting, all kinds of things that people really want to stay. And that's been quite remarkable. You know, we unfortunately have some people... Um, geologists and engineers who've been unemployed for almost two years, but they don't want to leave. They want to stay in the province. So our population has increased. We hit 4 million people far more rapidly than we thought we would. We've sort of seen a 10%. Uh, for a couple of years there, our population was growing by 10% a year, which is quite tremendous. That has slowed down, obviously, but uh, we are still seeing immigration even as the price of oil inches back up. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to go back to John's first question about NAFTA. Mm -hmm. we've, we've heard through this, this presidential campaign a lot of discussions about NAFTA being very terrible. Uh, what is the perspec your pers uh, perspective from Canada? What's wrong with it? <laughs> what do you see is actually wrong with it? You suggest you're willing to change, but... Uh, again, it's a bit of the preamble is working in the energy area. I just see it as extremely successful with the one failure being not in the Canadian part about U.S. failure to uh, approve the Keystone XL pipeline, but the rest of it has been very successful. So what's your perception from Canada about what's wrong with it, or do you think it's just an argument between Canada and between the United States and Mexico, possibly? Well, I can speak for Alberta, and then I'll look to my colleagues from the consulate maybe to address the federal government's position. I can speak to a little bit. We in Alberta don't have major concerns with NAFTA. It has been successful for us, as you point out, on the energy front, with our agriculture trade and a number of other things. We would like to see the list of professions under the labor mobility provision modernized. Those are fairly out of date. I don't even think computer scientists or computer programmers on there, as that list is 
25 odd, year old, odd years old. I think that maybe some in the auto sector might have some concerns or in other manufacturing professions where they have seen um, their manufacturing move uh, to Mexico or other places. I think they might have different concerns, but from the province's perspective, we don't have great concerns. That said, I think there's always opportunities to improve and to modernize. <coughs> And I know my provincial government is very focused, as I said before, ensuring strong environmental regulations, good labor standards, and any agreement. And I think that, you know, if the NAFTA were to be reopened, that there's an opportunity, given that it is a document that's 25 years old, that you can modernize those and bring some new best practices in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one resource that hasn't come up is water. You have plenty of it, we have very little of it. And uh, some years ago, I was at a meeting with uh, Western Canadians. Uh, their great fear was that, and this was more British Columbia, that we would invade your country <laughs> to capture that water that you have. Uh, is, it, is it true that the water that uh, you have in Alberta stays in Alberta? It is true. Yes, I'm sorry, I cannot be there. I mean, it is quite something you have to think about it. The Great Lakes is, what, 20% of the world's fresh water? And the fact that Canada and the U.S. manage that collaboratively and have never gone to war over that is quite something. I don't think two other countries could say the same thing. We do have a ban on bulk water exports from transboundary waters in Canada, so we can't, you couldn't, the United States couldn't just unilaterally decide to drain, drain Lake Michigan for your own use. Um, and then various provinces also have responsibilities there. You will see in Canada debates around um, bottled water plants that have set up in various jurisdictions and the amount that they're able to pull from a specific aquifer or water resource. Um, but it is fairly tightly legislated and controlled in Canada. And we, like you, have challenges with drought. We're seeing the impacts of climate change with these fires. When I moved, I moved from Edmonton to Washington last March, and in February in Edmonton, which is like the same latitude as Stockholm, Sweden, right? We had uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit in February, which is just unheard of, right? And then the temperature went back down, but still. So I think we're gonna need all our water for the foreseeable future. But. <laughs> we have another? Okay. <clears throat> Um, you've talked quite a bit about uh, the energy potential you've, you've got in the tar sands, but as I look at where uh, the map of, of wind resources are in the states, I would think they go straight up to eastern Alberta. Um, what is happening with wind development and renewables? Um, I don't expect there's much solar happening up there, but what is happening with uh, renewables in general, particularly wind? So we actually do have a lot of solar in Alberta. I mean, our days are short in the winter, uh, but Calgary on average has 335 days of sunshine a year. Uh, so one of the elements of Alberta's climate leadership plan is a move off of coal. We right now have 42% of our electricity that comes from coal-fired generation. We're phasing out emissions from coal by 2030. The plan is to replace two-thirds of coal with renewables and one-third with natural gas. Uh, so what has happened actually is as the grid in Alberta was built out to support further oil sands extraction, that actually has been built out in a way that will help just geographically where the wind and solar is, that'll help get more renewables on the grid. So part of what is happening uh, with the funds raised uh, through the carbon levy is some of that will be used to help some of the renewables grow. But we are out there right now, we've actually hired an expert, Terry Boston, who's advising the government in terms of how we transition away from coal in a way that um, assures pricing for consumers, um, and that is equitable to um, corporations that have made investments. I mean, there is an issue around stranded capital, and the government just last week announced a settlement with a few of the major um, coal-fired energy uh, producers in the province. But then, <clears throat> excuse me, looking about what supports does the government provide to renewables to bring them on stream and looking you know, part of the thing I do when I travel across the U.S. is speak to states about what they've done, like Minnesota, what have you done, what would you do differently, that type of thing, looking to other Canadian jurisdictions. Ontario has been in the news of late because they made some changes around um, renewable electricity that maybe if they had their time to go over, they would follow a slightly different path, but that's something that we're really promoting. Like I said, we'll have, we should have about 25% renewables by 2030, and a lot of that will be wind. Yeah. But there is, like I say, a fair amount of solar as well. You alluded earlier to um, 
when there are trade deals, that there are potentially winners and losers from, from those deals. So same can be true potentially for environmental regulations. Uh, so the carbon tax, for example, or moving away from coal. So I'm curious, I'm, I'm guessing this has, um, you, you have some plans in place to sort of figure out who is disrupted to some extent by whatever envir environmental regulations are being phased in and um, identifying who is being disrupted and figuring out how to um, make them, you know, help them, help to cushion any adverse effects from that. So we do have particular plans for coal dependent communities. So in addition to working with the corporation that's made that investment, we're working with that community to make sure that those employed uh, by that coal facility have other options. And I think there are some very real opportunities. For example, Alberta's commitment to methane reduction, that allows us to retrain people that did other jobs in the energy industry in those new methane reduction technologies and apply those not only in Alberta, but Colorado is taking great strides in other uh, states as well. <clears throat> We've got a program, oddly enough, that's training those that were unemployed um, from the energy sector in building sets um, for when we have major Hollywood productions come up to Alberta, you know, so tra those transferable skills, that type of thing. So it's something the government, we have the, Al it's called the Alberta Jobs Plan, uh, and they're tracking with quarterly updates in terms of how many jobs have been created and what the retraining is, and so it is very much a major focus of the government. How about uh, one more? There's one back over there. All right. I arrived a little bit late. I apologize. You definitely do live in a beautiful, beautiful country and, and province. Thank you. Um, since we're in the bastion of innovation here, beyond the energy sector and innovations in Alberta, what innovations are you most excited about? that then link you more to this beautiful Bay Area so we can have you back more often. <laughs> well, thank you for your question. I mean, we've got some really neat innovations in the agriculture sector. I'm always surprised when people think of energy or agriculture as sort of old, old technologies, old-fashioned sectors. If you look at where a lot of the innovations are coming out of, certainly for us, it's in oil and gas and agriculture. We have a growing uh, unmanned aerial vehicle sector in Alberta, so we've developed some interesting technologies. We have a company in Alberta, for example, that applies that supplies a GPS uh, system to all of the U.S. military. We've got some really neat stuff going on with operating agricultural vehicles remotely, so that uh, farmers, you know, often there's lots of farm accidents, unfortunately, where people get injured when vehicles roll over. So that type of thing as well. We've got a big push on the life sciences front. So some innovative health technologies are coming out of Alberta as well. Um, we have one company I just met with a couple weeks ago that has a really neat technology where you scan a label. It's part of the smart label technology, but it integrates all of the nutritional information so you can find out if your child has an allergy to peanuts, was this product just made in a facility with peanuts or on the same piece of equipment. So there's really a broad range of things, but I would say, you know, really the energy, clean energy technologies Agriculture, technologies, and life sciences would be three real growth areas for the province. We actually could have another question if there's time. If there's a man. Yes, over here. On a, perhaps a little bit lighter note, uh, you noted that Alberta is one of the largest producers of honey, mm -hmm. uh, along with Montana and a few other places that uh, there's a lot of grains. But the honey business is in almost as bad a shape as the energy business. And in the United States, uh, an awful lot of the honey producers, I think about 60% of them, uh, bring their hives to the uh, almond uh, uh, areas and receive some substantial subsidies, probably more than they receive for their honey nowadays. But the price of honey has fallen to about a third of what it used to be. And I doubt that farmers in Alberta, beekeepers, can take their hives all the way to Southern California because there are a lot of restrictions on the importation of hives into the United States. So is this another depressed area in, uh, in Alberta? And you know, what are you going to do about the Chinese importation of honey, if anything? Well, in my experience, a lot of the honey producers in Alberta produce honey as well as two or three other agricultural products. So while I'm not trying to diminish the impact on the honey producers or the reduced revenue from that, I mean, by and large, in my experience, they will have other crops that they also harvest. We also have uh, a number of producers that 
have sort of a, a boutique type of production where they make honey for their own restaurant or hotel and then sell the excess. So, I mean, we're always looking at those types of issues. You know, another one for us would be fertilizer. We have the largest fertilizer plant in North America and Alberta. We are committed to following through on our climate leadership plan. However, fertilizer industry is an energy intense industry and we want to make sure that we are allowing companies cited in Alberta to remain economic and competitive so we're not ceding ground to companies from China where they use anthracite coal to produce their fertilizer where then as in Alberta it's made from natural gas. So those are absolutely types of things that we are looking at. I don't know that there is an easy answer because something like honey is hugely important not only for the honey it produces but for the pollination across the province as well. So. Well, listen, I think you guys asked great questions. This whole session was terrific. Uh, David uh, Kennedy always told me that the American West meant the North American West, and so this session was perfectly appropriate. And having complimented David, I'm going to ask for his help. Uh, I didn't bring the program up here. Do we have a break now or what? We do. Okay, so we have a break. <laughs> Thank you very much.